Thank you all for joining this educational medical webinar provided by Handicraft Companies Medical Division. I'd like to introduce Dr. Claire King Miller. Dr. Miller is the program director of the Aero Digestive and Esophageal Center an Interdisciplinary Feeding Team at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and holds a clinical and research position in the Division of Speech Language Pathology at Cincinnati Children's. She has a faculty appointment as a field service assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and also holds an assistant professorship affiliate appointment at the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Cincinnati. She's a very busy person. Her research and clinical interests are in the area of pediatric dysphagia with a focus on instrumental swallowing assessment and clinical management of infants and children with congenital and acquired airway anomalies. She has authored publications and presented nationally and internationally on aspects of pediatric dysphagia. Today, Dr. Miller will be presenting feeding considerations for infants and children with craniofacial anomalies. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to present this webinar. And it's true, I have been working at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for quite a few years now. We, we will not mention how many years, but I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to focus my clinical and research work in the area of feeding and swallowing. It is such a diverse area, as I'm sure you all agree, and problems agree, uh, occur in just the context of so many etiologies, structural issues that we'll be discussing today, but also as a result of the accompanying neurologic conditions, cardiopulmonary compromise, genetic syndromes, sensory processing dysfunction, and so many other issues. So often there are multiple diagnoses and it just adds to the complexity. So it's good that we're here talking about this today. And um, I think that in my work I have learn something just about every day that I come to work. Um, it's never boring, that's for sure. So, you know, I come to you today as a colleague and I certainly don't have all the answers, but um, I will enjoy speaking with you about the anatomic and functional components that are affecting feeding and swallowing dynamics in children with clefts and craniofacial conditions. We will talk about some algorithms or ways that we can look at clinical and instrumental assessment um, decision making and then talk about some possible feeding intervention strategies. So just to set the stage here, there there are a number of prerequisites to safe and efficient feeding in infants and children. The infant is, has to be able to maintain a stable physiologic status during the work of feeding and has to have the ability to maintain a stable behavioral state. So postural postural stability with orientation around the midline, um, with neutral anterior posterior alignment of the head and neck, neutral alignment of the trunk needs to be maintained. There can be limiting patterns that we see because of abnormalities in structures or in muscle tone, and those things really do interfere with sucking efficiency and oral control. And we know that coordination of sucking and swallowing has to occur with breathing, and especially during rapid sequential swallowing sequences that we see in our infants. The research tells us we know that infants are going to have some oxygen desats with the effort of feeding. So when we have a baby with borderline saturations at baseline, the effort of feeding may prove to be too difficult and that's something that we need to to keep in mind. So as oral motor skills progress from sucking to cup drinking, um, we're moving from spoon feeding to eventually development of chewing, we've got to always have safe feeding and swallowing that's dependent on oral control and the ability to not only initiate but sustain adequate airway protection during swallowing. And then we set um, the framework for adequate intake so that a child can grow and thrive. So the next few slides are just an overview of the infant swallow so that we um, have a paradigm to have the rest of our discussion today. So the small size and shape of the infant um, oral cavity really create an ideal situation for sucking. And as you can see in this image, 
we've got the tongue base, the soft palate, and the pharyngeal walls all in very close approximation. The fat pads in the cheeks and the palates are stabilizing the lateral and superior walls of the oral cavity. The lips are closing and forming a seal around the nipple, and as the tongue and mandible depress, We've got suction generated up to 150 millimeters of mercury or units of pressure, which is amazing. And as that posterior portion of the tongue and jaw depress, the negative pressure is drawing the bolus into the pharynx. So with the posterior motion of the tongue, velopharyngeal is, a closure is going to occur during the swallow and um, this is going to prevent any retrograde flow up into the nasopharynx. Due to the very high position of the epiglottis, um, we see kind of a less marked retroversion of action um, during the swallow as compared to the adult swallow. So we've got this fill contract pattern um, as a result of this close proximity of structures. And as you watch this video, those of you with uh, sharp eyes are probably seeing a few episodes of pharyngonasal backflow that's happening as a result of incomplete pharyngeal closure in this clip. So you can probably appreciate how this is pushing up um, as the baby's swallowing. So the relatively small size of the cavity in comparison to the tongue facilitates a smooth and a rhythmic alternation of compression, suction, and transfer for swallowing. We know that infants are obligate nasal breathers and nasal breathing during sucking is occurring, but at the moment of the swallow, there's a distinct apneic interval. And what's key is the infant's ability to, to adapt to this decrease in ventilation that occurs um, during that apneic pause. So precise coordination of the respiratory pattern is going to have to happen during feeding so that airway protection can be maintained. So what we'll see, um, the typical infant pattern is inspiratory, expiratory, and we have got um, an apneic pause within that pattern. So disruption in the process may result if you get the airway opening when fluid is coming, um, you know, the body's need for air is going to override um, anything else. So that may result in penetration or aspiration into the airway during feeding. So to take a look at sucking, we know that sucking involves compression or positive pressure um, as well as a generation of, of negative pressure to transfer saliva or fluid for swallowing. So the ability to achieve compression is dependent upon a palatal surface for the tongue to work against, which can be an issue for inf infants or children that have really wide palatal clefts or big structural abnormalities. So the generation of the negative pressure, pressure or the suction component is dependent upon the sealed oral cavity and the tongue strength during sucking. You've got to have this negative pressure or suction so that the liquid is going to flow. With compression only, nothing's going to happen. We've got to have the suction so that liquid will be transferred to the hypopharynx for swallowing. So, you know, we often um, describe sucking in, as in two components. We've got non nutritive sucking used for calming, organizing, state maintenance, um, and it's composed of chains of sucking with intermittent swallows. Um, you'll have many more sucks per swallow than you will in comparison with nutritive sucking when, um, in, depending on who you read, you'll see uh, one to one to one suck, swallow, breathe, or some variation in one or two two sucks, sometimes even another suck per swallow that's interspersed with that breathing pause. So generally, um, we'll see in the nutritive sucking pattern a very brisk burst that is followed by less vigorous sucking um, cycles. So in cranial facial anomalies and syndromes, you know, we think about anomalies as being um, some diverse um, issue in terms of the growth of the head and facial bones. So the effects on feeding and swallowing we might be varied and they really depend on the extent of the structural and functional involvement as well as other factors um, such as neuromotor abnormalities. So cleft lip and palate represent the most common a congenital anomaly of the face. They're actually the fourth most common birth 
defect. And um, you will see varying um, degrees of incidence, but um, it seems that one in 750 um, is estimated quite a lot. There are an estimated 300 syndromes that also include cleft lip and palate as part of this syndrome, cleft lip, I should say, and or palate. So today we'll spend some time discussing cranial facial microsomia, um, 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, Treacher Collins, Pierre Robin, Charge, and think about some options for approaching feeding assessment and feeding intervention. So just to begin, when we think um, in generalities, the impact of the cleft lip and or palate is going to be variable, and it really depends on the degree of clefting, whether it's unilateral, bilateral, complete or incomplete, and if a cranial facial syndrome is present. You know, many times we won't see the babies that are born with just cleft lip and, and or palate, um, you know, if they're doing well with feeding. When we get called in, it's usually because there's a lot of other things going on um, or there's a syndrome present. So generally, just an isolated cleft lip will have a minimal effect on feeding um, in many cases. There may be some difficulty with having a sealed oral cavity with some fluid loss, sometimes some air intake. Um, but generally, uh, the, the, the babies do pretty well. With a bilateral, uh, complete bilateral cleft of the lip, it may have, have more of an effect on the infant's ability um, with feeding. And certainly with cleft palate, there's much more likely to have a more significant effect on feeding. Um, we may have a problem with the soft palate and the hard palate, or just a soft palate. So this opening is creating this space between the oral and nasal cavities. It's preventing the infant from being able to create the suction necessary for sucking. So when clefts, um, as we just mentioned, are isolated, usually, and you know, when nothing else is going on, we'll see intact oral reflexes for rooting and sucking, and the baby is doing everything they normally would do. Um, the problem is we see the normal um, compression, but the baby's unable to generate the suction force to get the milk to flow, milk or for formula to flow effectively. Um, in addition, the infant is probably going to be swallowing some air and experiencing some some reflux of the fluid into the nasopharynx because of the open communication. Um, we'll see a lot of energy being expended for little gain, and without feeding modifications such as those that can be provided by the speech pathologist, um, you've got the potential for inadequate intake um, and ultimately poor growth. So in situations where the cleft is occurring in conjunction with the syndrome, um, there with a the cranial facial syndrome, there is a real potential for upper airway obstruction because of anatomic and or physiologic anomalies. So the infant is potentially unable to coordinate things, suck, swallow, breathing in a coordinated sequence, and this is a real threat to airway protection during swallowing. So we've got just serious implications. We've got feeding insufficiency or inefficiency, compromised airway protection, and then we have, we have to think about the infant's respiratory health and their ability to, to thrive. So, um, and then in children with cranial facial anomalies, mid-face hypoplasia, um, other types of structural abnormalities, difficulties with oral control may happen, secondary to the restrictions that they have in the range of jaw, um, lip, or tongue motion. They may inadvertently lose control of the bolus, lose oral control, and um, inadvertently transfer into the hypopharynx before um, the onset of the swallow. And again, you've got a potential for airway compromise during feeding. So just very quickly, um, you know, when just reviewing clefts, cranial facial syndromes, um, in most cases the exact cause of the cleft is unknown. Um, there are known causes of clefts and related cranial facial disorders that include chromosomal and genetic um, disorders, environmental teratogens such as smoking, lead pollution, um, some medications, corticosteroids, Valium, um, thalidomide, dilantin, um, viruses, rubella, influenza. Um, maternal nutritional deficiency has also been associated with clefts. Um, and at times, mechanical interference in utero may cause the mandible to be retracted, um, restricting the space 
based in the oral cavity. I had a patient um, who's, who, who um, had a mom who had um, a divided uterus and the baby was really crammed in one side and the, the jaw was um, very retronathic and, and had he had tons of issues in combination with arthrogryposis. So, um, you know, when just thinking it, during embryonic development, we've got everything, all major organs and systems being formed in that first trimester. Um, it's all about the brachial apparatus. And I always bring my students through this um, in class just to remember um, that really it's all about what's happening at the beginning. And it's so fascinating to, to see um, that the first arch is giving rise to the mandible and the maxilla. Um, the second arch differentiates to form the facial nerve and the stapes, the styloid process, the upper body of the hyoid, the muscles of facial expression, um, the stapedius stylohyoid, and the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. The third arch is giving rise to the glossopharyngeal and hypoglossal nerves, the stylopharyngeus muscle muscle and the inferior body of the hyoid, as well as the posterior third of the tongue and the epiglottis. Then we've got the fourth brand, the fourth arch, excuse me, forming the superior laryngeal nerve, the laryngeal cartilages, and the cricothyroid muscle. So all the muscles and nerves that we're always thinking about um, as we think about feeding and swallowing. And when you just think about what's happening so early in utero, it begins to make a lot of sense when you see infants that had some kind of interruption um, during embryonic development that caused difficulties in the formation of um, the cranial nerve nuclei or in the muscles. So the cleft lip itself can be unilateral or bilateral, and it might range from a notch in the, the lip border all the way up through the alveolus. So usually um, the function is not as, a, as affected as it is in a cleft palate, but we've got um, questionable ability to get um, to, the, to the seal on uh, the breast or the bottle. So with a bilateral cleft lip, both sides of the lip are affected. The nose is going to appear very flattened, secondary to the separation of the orbicularis oris. So you've got complete separation of the tissue that would normally form the philtrum. So the, um, the prolabium or the filtral tissue as well as the premaxilla are you know, positioned in a very anterior spot. And the wideness of the cleft is really, you know, the nasal feature will be much more distorted. So in a cleft palate, again, it may be incomplete or complete. It may or may not occur with a cleft lip. Um, the primary or the pre-palate um, is technically defined as including structures anterior to the incisive foramen. And when we think about that, we're talking about the alveolus and the lip. So the secondary palate is, palate is including structures posterior to the incisive foramen. And we're thinking about the alveolus um, uh, the hard palate, excuse me, and the velum. So everything that's posterior to these incisive foramen. All right, so often we're going to have an isolated cleft palate um, that may occur with the syndrome, and we may or may not see a cleft of the second secondary palate that ranges, it could be a bifid or a split uvula, to extending all the way through the soft palate, um, along the palatine suture line all the way to the incisive forum. So um, you may or may not with a uh, bifid uvula also see a cleft, but um, could be. Both of my kids have um, bifid uvulas incidentally, but they don't have um, anything else going on as far as I know. So all right, so cleft lip and palate. We've got the lip and the palate forming separately. The lip is forming at seven weeks, the palate at nine weeks. Cleft lip and palate may occur, again, as isolated events, or sometimes they're together, sometimes complete, incomplete, unilateral, or bilateral. And again, um, the complete cleft of the lip extending from the lip through the alveolus, gum ridge, or the complete cleft of the palate extending through the uvula, velum, following the suture line through the hard palate onto um, the incisive foramen. So 
One um, just quick note about submucous clefts. Um, I have a little clip that I'll show you. Um, so the structures on the oral surface of the palate are intact. So you've got this underlying cleft though that's being covered by these membranes, mucous membrane. So the issue is there's a lack of muscular tissue or the muscles are positioned incorrectly. So you've got this translucent zone that you'll see upon intraoral inspection. Um, there may be a bony defect that you can feel on palpation in the midline of the hard palate. There's a bifid uvula um, that will occur often you will see that could be isolated but is also very frequently associated with this submucous cleft. Um, so again, this muscular defect is going to affect soft palate motion, um, velopharyngeal closure. This can be an issue um, with velopharyngeal insufficiency during speech and of course also nasopharyngeal reflux um, during feeding because you've got this lack of velopharyngeal closure and um, we'll take a look at that. So in thinking about Pierre Robin, um, this was named by a physician named Pierre Robin um, way back in 1923. So it's called a sequence and not a syndrome because micronathia, um, a smaller hypoplastic mandible, begins this sequence of events that leads to abnormal displacement of the tongue or also known as glossoptosis, and the possible subsequent formation of a cleft palate. Um, the positioning of the tongue is going to prevent the sides of the palatal shelves coming together. So you've got this airway obstruction also that's created by the posterior position of the tongue, and it really has the potential to significantly affect feeding, um, and even more so the infant's overall respiratory status. So Pierre Robin is, is characterized by a triad of features, respiratory obstruction, obstruction, micronathia, and glossoptosis. If the cleft palate's present, it's typically a U-shape. And it can be associated, Pierre Rubin can be associated with other syndromes um, characterized by retronathia cleft palate. Um, in addition to myopia, um, nearsightedness, or retinal detachment, as, as well as sensory, um, sensory neural hearing loss. You may have heard of Stickler um, syndrome. So the impact on feeding, airway obstruction is going to have an impact on efficiency and endurance, and it's the primary cause of feeding problems in infants with um, Pierre Robin. The, the respiratory effort associated with feeding is going to really result in increased work of breathing, um, tachypnea, uh, it has a negative effect on the infant's ability to sustain airway protection during feeding, and if you've got a cleft palate um, also present, um, you have even more issues with sucking efficiency. Um, in the, in really in terms of just the ability to, to generate uh, suction. So the posterior position of the tongue makes it difficult um, to get nipple placement onto the body of the tongue. And it's just overall restricting the full range of movement, limiting oral transferability. So we really um, have to work with the medical team, um, close monitoring to determine whether or not oral feeding is even feasible or safe. Um, perhaps non-oral uh, nutrition will be required until airway stability is achieved. And at times, surgical intervention, such as a mandibular distraction to bring the jaw forward, will be needed, will be required to increase the oropharyngeal space. Um, you know, centers differ on whether it's going to be a mandibular distraction or perhaps a trach is going to be needed to relieve the upper airway obstruction and um, allow the patient to have an adequate respiratory um, status. So craniofacial microsomia, um, this is characterized by underdevelopment of the facial structures, the mandible, the maxilla, the ears, soft tissues and nerves, and it's usually a unilateral um, malformation. It is reported to be the second most cranial facial defect, though there is some variability in the prevalence estimates just because of the definition that's used for cranial facial microsomia. So there is a big range in severity. You might see slight facial asymmetry, like our little girl that you that we saw in clinic, you see her on on the right as opposed to the, um, our little infant on the left there. So uh, you may sometimes see bilateral asymmetric involvement as well. Usually one side is going to be affected more than the other. So respiratory compromise may occur secondary to the mandibular hypoplasia and um, 
overall, the etiology of this is unknown, but it's been associated with prenatal maternal exposures and rare genetic variations. The impact on feeding, generally infants that have cranial um, facial microsomia will have difficulty because of this restriction in mandibular excursion. Um, there's muscle weakness and abnormalities in tongue position um, that are going to affect the range of motion of the tongue. And again, the cleft palate will impact upon the generation of negative pressure or suction. Um, and then upper airway obstruction may be exacerbated with the respiratory effort of feeding. So 22Q deletion syndrome. This is considered to be the most common micro deletion syndrome occurring in one out of 4,000 births. So we will see um, varied signs and symptoms and groupings of these features have traditionally been classified as de George, velocardiofacial syndrome, um, Spritzen syndrome, and Basically, what's happening is there's a micro deletion on the long arm of chromosome 22. So the features can be varied, but generally include congenital heart defects, facial dysmorphism, including mid-face hypoplasia, um, a square nasal root, um, narrow palpebral feature, fissures, excuse me, minor auricular abnormalities, and um, retronathia. Uh, palatal abnormal abnormalities such as a submucous cleft palate, there may be velopharyngeal insufficiency, um, and sometimes a bifid uvula. Pharyngeal hypotonia and um, abnormal cricopharyngeal function may be um, documented on a video swallow study, and that seems to be going along with um, 22Q deletion syndrome. So again, that inability to generate um, sufficient pressures for feeding um, will happen if the palatal abnormalities are present. And if there is um, incomplete um, velopharyngeal closure during swallowing, this retrograde flow into the pharynx can be very disorganizing um, to the baby feeding. Um, with the hypotonia that may happen with pharyngeal contraction or the, the pharynx, if there's hypotonia, the, hypotonia there, um, contraction may not be complete, so we will not see um, complete clearance after the pharyngeal swallow. And um, significant feeding difficulties will occur, especially if you've got a cricopharyngeal dysfunction or um, obstruction to flow once swallowing occurs through that pharyngoesophageal sphincter into the esophagus. So endurance for feeding for getting enough in is going to be an issue, and especially if there's underlying cardiac, cardiac issues present, endurance can be um, problematic. So treat your Collins. This was also named for another physician who um, back in 1900 described a couple of children who had very small cheekbones, um, uh, notches, stretching, and, and the lower eyelids. And um, it, this is a problem because of uh, problems in uh, the first and sec second brachial arches that we just saw, and it's characterized by hypoplasia or underdevelopment of um, the structures, maxilla, mandible, um, the cheekbones, and there's variable effects on the muscles of mastication and the temporomandibular joint. So children that have Treacher Collins may have accompanying coanal atresia, cleft lip and or palate, um, they may have malocclusion, and airway compromise is usually in a very immediate problem after birth, um, secondary to the micronathia and the posterior tongue position. Sometimes um, this obstruction of the oropharynx and the hypopharynx is such that immediate intervention is, is um, necessary, such as a trach, um, so that the patient can have adequate respiratory um, status. So the impact on feeding with Treacher Collins, the restricted range of jaw motion will affect um, efficiency of sucking. Um, at, again, that posterior positioning of the tongue makes placement of the nipple onto the body of the tongue difficult. And um, 
adaptations in feeding, such as the ones that we will talk about, such as sideline, may help to counteract that gravitational pull of the tongue um, backward, and it may assist with relieving airway obstruction to a degree. We can use this in, in other scenarios as well, um, and it, it, it is worth a try. Of course, if um, a cleft palate is present, there will be difficulty. You know, you need to have um, a place uh, to position the nipple so that there can be um, apposition of the tongue, and if, if there is not good placement um, potential, it can just um, compound the feeding difficulties. So last but not least, charge. Um, we see a lot of patients with charge coming into our center, and it is a genetic syndrome, and it's referring to a, a known pattern of features that's referred to as this acronym of CHARGE. And definitely there is variation in, in severity of the features that we see in children with CHARGE. The feeding and swallowing problems are significant, and um, and this is both due to the structural deficits that we see and also due to cranial nerve involvement. Each letter of the acronym stands for the features, coloboma, and we've got heart defects, uh, coanal atresia, retardation of, of growth and development overall, and ear abnormalities and deafness. So um, I think what we see many times with charge is that the cranial nerve abnormalities are very significant and really are um, varied in the children that we see. The, the ones, um, many of the children tend to have very significant long-term motor and sensory issues that impact upon their ability to, to safely feed um, or efficiently feed. and. Um, the abnormal functioning, I think, of facial, glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerves have the biggest impact on feeding. Sometimes the, the cranial nerve nuclei are malformed, sometimes they're not there, and um, it really, when we think about the efficacy of the treatment strategies that are being employed um, and nerve pathways, it really makes us think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, Sometimes hypotonia, low muscle tone, will accompany charge, and then will, the oral facial hypotonia, hypotonia can also contribute to the feeding deficits. All right, so let's turn to assessment, and forgive me for this very busy little slide here, but we've been working on standardizing how we approach decision making in the clinical assessment and also in our our treatment paradigms and this is I am showing just an overview of a sample algorithm or a clinical pathway for decision making in the clinical assessment phase and so with children that are are you know coming into you with cleft lip or palate cranial facial anomalies you know you definitely want to begin with your oral MEC examination looking at the type and extent of the cleft We'll move on to the non-nutritive part of the protocol, then the nutritive protocol, um, all along taking notes about functional capability, and also before embarking on treatment, you want to make sure you are documenting, documenting any clinical signs or symptoms of swallowing dysfunction. So if the answer, you've done your protocol, you know the baby needs treatment, but you're concerned about airway protection or the safety of feeding before you push on with treatment, you want to think about an instrumental study, most likely, to just give yourself peace of mind and know what you're what you're dealing with. And if the patient is, is able to take nutritive input, um, even, you know, there are no standard statements. There are no um, standard standardized statements, I want to say, about the volume that a patient needs to take to get a valid, a reliable video swallow study. You will hear people say different things about what somebody has to be able to take. What we will say is if you have someone who even, even can take an ML, um, you will be able to get enough um, information about swallow function um, depending on the question that you're asking in the instrumental exam. Now, if you've got someone who is not taking anything at all, let's say you are so concerned about safety um, that you don't even want to introduce anything orally, that is when a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing or a fee study might be a good um, alternative. 
So my next slide, just to give the overall goal of the clinical assessment, um, what you want is bottom line. How will you minimize the effect of the structural difference on the baby's function, on the baby's feeding function. So you're going to begin with a very thorough review of the patient's medical and developmental history. So familiarize yourself with the syndrome, um, familiarize yourself with the cleft and what does that mean and what happened. Think about a patient with charge and, and where you may see, thinking back to the brachial arches all the way down to the head and the neck, what is going on there? So knowing about what are the patient's diagnoses? What is the patient's surgical history? What are their developmental milestones looking like at this point in time? Just to really get a good picture, you know, do your homework before you put your hands on um, the baby or the child. So um, the interview with the caretaker, um, the parent or the caretaker, really gives a lot of valuable input into um, their perception of what's going on with the problem. Because many times we're not seeing the patient first out of the gate. We may be if they're in the NICU, um, we may be if they uh, were in a rural area and they haven't had any type of evaluation, but many times feeding is already going on when we get the patients into the office. And we want to talk to the caretaker about what is their perception of what a typical feeding looks like, what is their goal, um, you know, what is their goal for what's happening here, and you know, try to do some conversations about what is going to be um, a functional goal looking at the whole picture of the patient, and I know that can be very tough. So the non-nutritive assessment, um, and I will try this again, you know, I uh, was trying to pack as much information in as I could into our, our chance to talk together today. Um, so again, I have a busy slide, and for those of you who can't see it, we're beginning with um, making some judgments about position and posture, the adequacy of the muscle tone. Ideally, you're looking for orientation around the midline, alignment of the head and neck, um, neutral alignment, some slight flexion in that trunk, hip, and knees. Um, we know that a lack of head and neck control and positional stability may lead to abnormal um, oral motor patterns. We've seen um, kids that are extending back, arching their back. Um, think about what's happening with their tongue at that point. We're looking at um, symmetry, structures, tone, um, the range and the strength of oral um, movements, and trying to get an idea of presence, absence of adaptive oral reflexes, thinking about rooting and sucking, thinking about protective reflexes such as cough and gag, and you know what is the infant doing? Are they rooting? Are they engaging in a non-nutritive sucking pattern? What does the strength and rhythmicity of that non-nutritive pattern look like um, to you? And is the patient, do they seem to be managing their secretions? Do they have what look to be spontaneous swallowing efforts? Um, and we want to, to make sure we have just a good clinical picture of what things look like non-nutritively before we move into the nutritive assessment. So we know that the infant is going to have physiologic responses to the work of feeding. Um, there are, we are going to be alert for changes in color, changes in heart rate, um, changes in respiratory rate during the nutritive assessment. Of course, you want to be working with the medical team to know what the infant's baseline is. You have clearance to even be involved in this part of the assessment when you're working with your team. And we're interested in what the infant's ability is um, to maintain homeostasis during the work of feeding. So knowing what the normal heart rate is, what the respiratory rate, you know, generally we're not feeding, um, you know, within certain parameters. And these, uh, we need to know what is going to be normal for that baby. We know that um, we have got to think about the respiratory rate, 60 or less. We want research that tells us that we know we're going to see some oxygen desaturation, but you know where to draw the line. And that's where we're working with the medical team because with the borderline saturations, as I was mentioning at the beginning um, of this talk, the effort of feeding may be too much. And that's your job as a clinician to be providing information to the medical team, to the physician about what happens with the effort of feeding for the patient. So 
can the patient initiate and maintain a, a sustained rhythmic pattern of sucking, swallowing, and respiration? If the caregiver is doing the feeding, are they recognizing the cues? Are they responding in an appropriate manner um, to the baby? Uh, are they missing all the cues? And I'll show you a little clip where there's a lot of cues that are being missed. Um, same in toddlers and children looking at oral motor skills for feeding um, compared to what the chronologic age expectation might be, but also um, in terms of what they've got in terms of structure and function. So introducing, you know, what kinds of textures are they taking or are they appropriate to what you're seeing in terms of oral motor skills? If you have anterior, posterior tongue movements or some compensatory movement, is the material being given to the patient um, appropriate? Hopefully, the patient is not being given hot dogs or sausage or something that is going to require a lot of oral motor manipulation. So, um, looking at what is happening at the baseline. So, um, for those of you who can't see this clip, I'm I'm going to just tell you, here's a baby that we were consulted on who came in. Um, she was born with a bilateral cleft of the lip and an incomplete cleft of the palate. She had been discharged and she was using a, a feeder um, that has been out there for a long time, um, the special needs feeder. And the mother was very concerned about coughing and choking that was happening with feeding. And so we are just watching the mom as she is doing um, some feeding here and um, she does tell us that this is one out of six children that she's had um, she feels very comfortable with what she's doing but as you watch what she's doing with the bottle she's sort of allowing she's sliding it in and out um, every time the baby stops sucking um, or takes a pause she immediately begins wheeze and uh, you know we're watching the baby you know first um, respond you will see some distress signals the baby's eyes are widening and finally the baby sort of uh, shuts down closes its eyes and so um, this is a, a what is a good example of if you know the type of feeding method that's being employed we need to always be watching the baby's cues and problem solving through ways that we can help the baby be efficient successful and safe with feeding so again in older children with cranial facial anomalies again looking at what compensatory uh, compensatory skills are already being used um, helping to understand what the range of textures are being given um, I think especially to um, if you have a baby with the cleft palate and the palate is, is not going to be fixed um, quite yet knowing um, that it is okay to begin you know with medical clearance to introduce pureed foods and helping uh, the parent or the caretaker, the feeder, um, understand uh, that the child will learn um, some diversion of the tongue around uh, the area of the cleft to transfer the puree back. So, all right. After you know you get through your assessment um, protocol, and um, there are a lot of different protocols out there. There is no one agreed upon standardized assessment. Um, we do know that. Um, you know, the things that I just addressed in those slides are the things that we're looking at in the context of the clinical eval and the signs and symptoms of possible um, swallowing dysfunction, threats to airway compromise will include um, over coughing, um, choking and gagging, although um, many times with infants and children there's the possibility of silent aspiration and we know that the sensitivity of the bedside assessment is not good um, in situations where there is um, uh, silent aspiration uh, happening. So noisy wet respirations um, sometimes will be indicative of some problems with airway compromise. Um, certainly bradycardia, um, episodes of apnea, increased respiratory rate, decreased oxygen saturation levels are pointing to airway protection issues during the feeding and um, you know, obviously, if you've got food or liquid um, coming from the trach um, tube, you uh, we know something is going on here. So we want to confirm what's happening. You know, we cannot do that um, by way of just looking at the patient. We need to get an instrumental exam, and it's essential before embarking upon treatment in any um, situation or scenario where you are concerned. So. Um, 
in the clinical pathway then, you're looking at skills, functional, dysfunctional. Is treatment indicated? Um, infants with signs and symptoms need to be discussed with the referring physician or team, considered for an instrumental assessment. Um, knowing what's going on with the treatment plan may impact what you're going to do. Um, depending on the center, the lip generally occurs within three to six months, the palate repair between nine and 12 months, um, oral motor feeding treatment may be recommended um, to assist with transition to the cup before the palate's repaired. I mean, we know that vigorous sucking can compromise the repair site. Uh, there are times when the mandibular distraction procedures, such as um, this baby right here, um, this may be done very early on to lengthen the mandible and bring the tongue forward. Um, should we be getting in there to try to do, give the, the infant some oral sensory motor experiences to help keep them on the pathway to oral feeding? So. Uh, there are many forks in the road along the way um, as to what you're doing in terms of um, recommending an instrumental exam, recommending feeding treatment, recommending monitoring in the context of treatment, and perhaps then also going on to um, an instrumental exam. So the options, just quickly, we've got the video swallow study, which gives us an overall view of all the phases of swallow, or we've got the fees exam. So again, we've got to be able to get enough contrast in to get a reliable and a valid video swallow study. And um, I talked about there's no absolute required amount, but you've got to be able to see something. One of the biggest drawbacks of the video swallow study is the ability to be able to assess breastfeeding. So although you, you, know, you can ex have the mom express it, put it in a bottle, you're looking at different skills because the sucking action um, used during breast and bottle feeding is different. And you may have a VSS or a VFSS assessment, but it may not be be representative of, of swallowing function and airway protection ability. So that brings me, um, although, um, you know, the video swallow study, if you're doing bottle feeding, it does allow you to introduce compensatory strategies and to, to, to determine the effect of those. So the alternative, when you have somebody who is not um, feeding orally at all, we can do a fees exam, we can, um, pass a scope transnasally, get a great look at anatomy and um, the patient's ability to manage their secretions. We can get a good idea about sensory threshold, especially when there are cranial nerve issues and you are concerned that there can be um, some sensory as well as motor um, problems. And it, importantly, it can give you some insight about the patient's readiness for you to introduce oral feeds. And maybe it's going to be a gradual thing where you're beginning with just some drops um, or controlling the flow um, by way of using a, um, a little uh, syringe inside a nipple. You're not using a syringe to instill the formula, but inside the nipple and just a very careful administration of that um, to begin to introduce some nutritive stimulus. So this is a video swallow study that just shows um, issues that occur with the submucous cleft. And so I have got, um, I'm hoping that I don't really want my volume to um, pop up on here, but as you can see, this baby has got some big problems um, with velopharyngeal closure and significant amounts of, of franco-nasal retrograde flow. And um, we were, um, you know, very fortunate to be able to take a look at him in another context and also to look at changes in positioning and later repair of this cleft. Um, here is a, a baby with Pierre Robin sequence and um, in this the stills, this is just a still exam. I'm not going to um, show a clip in the entrance of time, but in this scenario, we use just a drop of green food coloring to mix with her secretions using her pacifier um, to then help her transfer back for swallowing. So you can see on um, the right side of the screen, I have a still image of her secretions. And you can see that she has got secretions that are um, just along the lateral pharyngeal walls, um, hanging around her arytenoids, right into the anterior commissure, um, in the endolaryngeal area, on the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis. And here's a, another still below. This this um, baby has very edematous structures. So I 
stuck another still just below so you can see how well in the still um, version of this, we can see um, the liquid coursing down the lateral channels. Here's the upper esophageal sphincter um, right behind. You can see this little travel of uh, fluid into the interlaryngeal area. So this is uh, technically deep penetration, and you can see um, that the patient's airway is wide open before the onset of the swallow, and you can see exactly where the patient's going to be vulnerable to penetration or aspiration. Now, if these lateral channels fill up, you know, if we don't start getting some onset of the swallow, some hyolaryngeal elevation and, and pushback of the epiglottis, we may see some fill up along these lateral channels and, and ultimate spill over the area epiglottic folds into the endolaryngeal area. All right, and lastly, we'll get to some more feeding strategies. We've talked about a few of them already. Um, just to highlight, we must have a patent airway. Um, that is the most immediate concern. That is happening before you are doing anything at all. Airway is first always first. Um, I also want to stress that there is no recipe or guaranteed set of strategies that's going to work with everybody's feeding issues. Every patient's different. Everybody's anatomy is going to be a little different. Everybody's set of issues is going to be a little different. And the dynamics just are such that there is such a wonderful role for speech pathology um, in the assessment and in the treatment protocol. Um, the parent or the caretaker should always be involved with problem solving, and we want to be able to minimize energy expenditure and maximize the effect of the infant's efforts um, to feed, assuring that we can get adequate volume to grow. So for breastfeeding, just very quickly, I will be very transparent and tell you I am not a lactation consultant, but I work with one. And um, with cleft lip, breastfeeding may be successful. Um, the feeder can manually assist with lip closure. There may be some taping that's already in place. The gap may get filled in with the breast tissue. Um, and with cleft palate, though, we've got a different situation. We don't have time to go into this in detail, but we've got different skills needed for breastfeeding um, than we do for bottle feeding. And, you know, I just think of it as the negative pressure is going to, excuse me, going to be needed to pull the nipple into the mouth during breastfeeding and to maintain it there. And then you've got to have compression um, as well as the extraction of milk. So this lack of ability to generate suction is going to limit the ability to latch and transfer the milk. So the supplemental nursing system can be used. Um, Honestly, this can be difficult to maintain for long periods of time, but encouragement should always be given, and the mother should always be supported in pumping breast milk um, for presentation in a bottle if, that's, if that is what happens. So compensatory strategy, we've got positioning. Um, we talked about a little bit already. We've got specialized bottle systems. I talked a little bit about ways we can gradually introduce oral feeds um, just to put the patient on the pathway to oral feeding. So positional and postural adaptations can be can be wonderful. Um, an upright upright cradle hold, elevated sideline. Um, this may decrease nasal reflux, promote posterior trans. Um, transfer the fluid, um, and then even in children, alter the pathway of the bolus. So the elevated sideline position, the rationale is relieving upper airway obstruction, um, facilitating feeding synchrony, um, it enhances respiratory support. The idea is the less anti-gravity movement will decrease gravitational flow and allow the gravitational flow of milk and allow for increased control. Um, I've got a sideline um, VSS here, but in the interest of time, let's talk about pacing very quickly, um, the feeding imposed pause intervals. But these can be tri tricky, and we have to be sure that we know um, what we're doing is not disorganizing the baby, but in fact supporting um, the coordination of respiration and swallowing by allowing time for ventilation and recovery. Um, there are some investigations right now about the efficacy of pacing. Um, the the La Morstat study was done in with preterm infants. I put that on the reference list. Um, it's interesting because it shows less bradycardia. Um, but again, the feeder has got to be careful to read cues during feeding as abrupt, you know, taking the nipple all the way out, which is what happens when not done well, um, the baby will become more agitated. 
Modulating flow, um, this is a very commonly used strategy. Again, rationale decreases in flow rate um, may be accomplished by changing the type of nipple, nipple system. Um, we know that um, we may be able to enhance feeding performance by decreasing swallowing frequency and volume, increasing time for ventilation. So we've got some specialized um, nipples and bottle systems to assist with flow. Um, very familiar, um, the Mead Johnson, and the Medela special needs we talked about earlier have been around for a long time. The Mead Johnson, um, the feeder is in control of the flow, very compressible. Um, the feeder has got to be in in tune with the um, infant's goal, and there's got to be, it's going to work the best when there's some sort of palatal surface um, for the baby to compress against, and compress the nipple against, their tongue against, and the nipple against. The Medela Special Needs Feeder, we talked about that already. Um, it does have a one-way uh, valve, um, but the feeder may also use a assistive squeeze. It doesn't require suction. Um, the Dr. Brown Specialty Feeding System has the one-way valve. Um, at the infant, this is a great system, the, of, of the infant will be able to express fluid um, by way of compression eff, um, efforts, and it's very nice. It will let the infant self-pace uh, as they feed. Um, what's really wonderful about it is um, infants with cleft palate can use a bottle that looks very normal, and um, there's multiple flow rates that can be matched to the infant's skills. And then um, after palatal repair and depending on feeding is going, um, the mom or the feeder can just not use the valve anymore, but just continue to use the same feeding system. And um, I missed my E on valve there on my slide. I apologize for that. Um, but again, it's infant regulated and really allows the infant um, the opportunity to begin to synchronize their own sex follow breathe efforts. The pigeon nipple. Um, here is another uh, one-way valve. Works with compression efforts. The feeder is not assisting um, with the flow, but we've got um, a firm and a soft side to this nipple, and and it can be uh, the the soft side is for the nipple placement um, to the tongue. The firm side is to place against the available palate. It comes in two flow sizes, um, but the appropriateness of this particular flow um, and nipple really needs to be matched to the infant skills. So for reference. This is a little summary um, of just considerations. I have um, talked about a lot of these things in the context, and I just sort of put them together for you here, just things to think about. I did want to, I, I know feeding talk can be finished without talking about um, viscosity of fluid, and I really just put this in here. Um, by way of reminding people, there are a lot of other ways um, to treat airway protection issues. Does um, viscosity um, change work? Yes, at times it does. Do other things work? Should we try other things? Yes. Should this always be a go-to? No. And it is probably the most widely recognized, though, and perhaps overused compensatory strategy. And there is a rationale, but it must be used carefully. There are products and guidelines, and I put these in the slides. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out to say no thickeners are appropriate for infants less than 37 weeks gestation. Um, this is not meant to be a comprehensive list. There are cautions associated with multiple products that are out there. Guidelines vary, and um, SLPs out there, you are advised to be aware of your institutional guidelines for product use and precautions. Um, the viscosity of the liquid will vary based on the type of the product you're using, based on how the, the liquid is prepared, and what the base liquid characteristics are. Um, and especially with with breast milk, not to be on a soapbox here, but there are special considerations. We've got digestive enzymes in human milk that are going to break, um, break down rice cereal, break down starch-based thickeners. Um, you're right back to a thin formula. Again, you can use a gel thickener that's not adding calorie, but the challenge is that infant is going to have to get a bigger volume to achieve the same a nutrient intake. Um, and in fact, when you're adding um, thickening agents, sometimes you're adding more of a nutrient load and you're creating actually nutrient load toxicity potential. So there are concerns. We must work together. We need multi multi multidisciplinary clinical practice guidelines um, for this. So 
it should not be a unilateral decision by the speech pathologist. You must work with your team and know that there are big concerns with gel-based thickeners, um, contraindicated for children of any age with a history of necrotizing intercolitis, um, bowel, um, isochemic bowel disease, gastroschisis, or immunocompromise. So here are um, some summary of the feeding deficits that we've talked about, compensatory strategies, and I am going to stop right there since I know I'm over time.